Thank you for coming. This is a wonderful turnout. First of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Tleti Tene First Nation. My name is Ramona Rose, head of the Archives Department here at the University, and we're delighted to welcome you uh, back to our Archival Connection speaker series that is continuing this year. Uh, we're very grateful for receiving external funding, community support uh, to be able to continue with it. So our hope is that through these talks, archives can connect to contemporary society and to issues of concern now by showing the continued relevance of archives and records in society. Um, just a word about next month's presentation. Uh, it will be in the same room, and it's a joint colloquium with the NRESI series on March 22nd. And we will be having Dr. Tom Osden Schilling, who's an assistant professor of John Hopkins University in the anthropology department there, give a presentation. He'll be talking about ethnographic research that he conducted among Bulkley Valley researchers and the concept of resilience. That is, that environmental systems and social forms can be designed to bounce back from disruptive change. And in particular, how this concept has influenced a rapidly growing range of planning strategies in northern BC. So a few notes about today's talk. It is being live streamed, uh, particularly to those in the regional campuses. So hello. Um, you'll be able to join us remotely and send your questions either by email to archives at unbc.ca or by texting, and you can call 250-999-0478. So Dr. Uh, Leonard's presentation will be about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have about 20 minutes for um, questions, and Dr. John Swanger will be moderating that session. So a little bit about Dr. Leonard. Uh, Dr. Frank Leonard is an adjunct associate a professor with the Department of History at the University of Victoria. He's a historian of infrastructure development in Western Canada and the United States. His book, A Thousand Blunders, The Grand Trunk Pacific Railway and Northern British Columbia, published in 1996, has received several awards. For eight years, he taught at the College of New Caledonia here in Prince George. During the 1970s, he received stipends from the Swedish Institute to learn the language and then to study and lecture as a visiting scholar in the Department of History at the Uppsala University. So please mel welcome me in joining Dr. Frank Leonard. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to return to Prince George, particularly when the weather's so good. I expect to gloat to my wife tonight about how our weather up here is better than hers in Victoria. Jag skulle vilja också hälsa lyssnare här som pratar svenska. Finns det någon här? Well, I've just at least tried to demonstrate to those who do speak Swedish, perhaps a um, uh, long distance, just how rusty my spoken language is. Even so, I want to begin by alerting you to one element of Swedish pronunciation. And this is for you, Steve. Uh, in Swedish, W is pronounced as V. Thus, Venegren, the protagonist in this talk this afternoon, Wallenberg, the most famous family of capitalists in 20th century um, Sweden, and Wallander, Henning Monkel's magnificent fictional detective. Now, if we pronounce the initials in bold at the bottom that designate the most important Venegren company in BC, W, G, B, C, in English, not only do they sound like the call letters of an American Fox TV station in Mississippi, but they also require more syllables to pronounce. In Swedish, it is much quicker. Ve, ge, be, se. Ve, ge, be, se. And that's the way that uh, um, Venegren and his subordinates talked about this company in BC. So from now on, I'm going to use the Swedish pronunciation of those initials because it's quicker. And now you know it. Vegabese. As these maps from a series of newspapers and magazines in 1957 indicate, Venegrenland was the designation of a region in northeastern BC surrounding the Rocky Mountain Trench, more or less, which had no clear geographic boundaries and no measurable extent. <laughs> 
The name was coined by Vancouver Sun reporter Jack Scott during a visit to the area, which had just been revealed as the, as the setting for an ambitious development program of Swedish financier Axel Wenegren. The conceit worked in two ways. Obviously, the last part of the name, Grenland, rested on association with Greenland. Both domains were northern, cold, and remote, at least from Vancouver and Victoria. But Vete Grenland could also be associated with Wonderland, to which Lewis Carroll takes us in Alice's Adventures. Scott continued, it begins to come into focus only if you happen to be sitting, as I am at the moment, in the heart of this immense tenth of a province, an Alice in Venegrenland. When you fly by the hour down the broad wooded trench west of the Rocky Mountains, straight as a bowling alley, gazing ahead to new horizons, each embracing the potential kingdom of a Swedish gentleman who invented a vacuum cleaner, it all seems too fantastic to be reality. Spoiler alert, it was. <laughs> Let's first consider previous accounts of the Vanegren project. The dotted line in this image um, from the agreement of 1956, I cheated with a photograph from 1957, um, to the dam is the traditional narrative, as I say. Um, the most important event on this path, nationalization of part of the Venegren concern uh, in August 1961, is just that, the most important. It's so close to the Venegren's death in November of that year, that some have speculated that it caused it. In the half century since nationalization, historians and social scientists uh, have emphasized different elements or ideas along the path. For the first 20 years, political historians castigated or celebrated Benedict for his victory over Vanegren, clearly one of his lesser opponents. In studies from the 1990s and the aughts, emphasis shifted to mega project analysis with its catchphrase, high modernism. During the past decade, work has appeared that highlights the negative impact of the project on indigenous communities. I should mention here that in all of the Swedish documents that I examine, there is not a single reference to the indigenous people of the region, even as Indiana Indians, let alone as Sekane. Perhaps the only common feature through these shifts is a curiosity, a reference in each type of interpretation to Vanegren's uh, proposed monorail, for which I have inserted a logo. In all three interpretations, even those not political, Bennett occupies the foreground, while Vanegren remains a minor player, little more than part of the setting for the dam. Now I shall follow Alice down a historical rabbit hole to an alternative path for Vanegren's activities here. This is based largely on the sources that I examined in Sweden concerning the project. Vanegren say, you all know what that is now. Vegabese, the first uh, Vendegren company in BC, opened in the fall of 56 and closed in 64. In this narrative, the direction appears less clear because there's no obvious climax at the dam, <clears throat> as in the received narrative. Along this path, the most prominent and frequent word is surveys. Um, the surveys and estimates created by Venegren's companies are not thrilling reading, believe me. But when combined with Swedish sources, they suggest an interpretation of Venegren's activities here, for which I have inserted a Swedish caricature of the financier, where he and his subordinates occupy the center rather than the periphery of the story. If we are to understand Venegren's activities in BC, we must realize, like all his other ventures, the main, if not the only goal of this project was to extract a return, to make a profit on the investment. And at the conclusion of this presentation, I shall offer an estimate of its return, or lack of it. How to deal with the international mystery man who burst into BC consciousness in February 1957? BC newspapers were first reduced to reprinting boilerplate from wire services. 
To fit his expected activities in a giant deal, the province newspaper sketched an outline of the career of an entrepreneurial giant. Not as well known as the Rockefellers, he ranks with them in terms of power and influence. It also opined that he was worth $100 million. Ever modest, Vanegren uh, claimed that he was not as wealthy as Henry Ford. But the Sun described him as the Swedish Midas. For the next few minutes, I shall provide some context for Vanegren's career that these newspapers so clearly lacked. Vanegren's ostentatious lifestyle contributed to rosy evaluations of his finances. With his elegant wife, Marguerite, in the upper left, he traveled the world in high style and acquired a series of mansions that frequently became the subjects of examination and envy of supermarket tabloids. In 1933, he began to transfer his business headquarters to the Bahamas, in part to evade the regulations and taxes of the new social democratic government in Sweden. Of course, the weather was also nicer. Across the bay from NASA on Hog Island, he built the mansion Villa Shangri-La in the upper right, with terrace gardens modeled on those of Versailles. In 1934, he returned to Sweden and purchased Heringeslott, or castle, in the archipelago south of Stockholm. And in 1937, he acquired from Howard Hughes the Southern Cross in the lower right the largest privately owned steam yacht in the world at that time. Near the end of his life, from the Swedish king, Vanegren received the Vasa Cross in the upper left, the highest award for Swedish civilians. He also erected the most prominent skyscraper in Stockholm, the Vanegren Center in the lower left, as a monument as well as a base for his philanthropy in supporting various scientific and humanitarian projects. After a university in Peru awarded him an honorary doctorate in 1941, he incorporated the honorific in all his correspondence. So from then on, it's Dr. Vanegren. After his death, the location of a bust near the center of his hometown on the right suggests that many revere him. How could he do this? Born in 1881 into a wealthy family in a small town on the west coast of Sweden, Vanegren graduated from the Berlin School of Business in 1903. His greatest entrepreneurial achievement was the creation, manufacture, and sale of vacuum cleaners under the Electrolux brand. He created the company organization in 1919. By 1921, he rolled out the breakthrough Model 5 with its distinctive shape of a loaf on skis in the lower left. My parents had one. During the 1920s, he applied American personal demonstration sales techniques in the center left and an arresting marketing campaign, such as the ad that promised to fly women away from drudgery in the upper right. By 1945, Electrolux factories, like the one in the lower right, had spread across Europe and the US. There was even one in Montreal. In 1928, Van der retired as managing director of Electrolux, but he made, maintained control of the company through his equity holdings. In 1942, Vanegren was put on the proclaimed list of bloc nationals, or blacklisted, by both Britain and the US. The reason was never made public, which has encouraged a series of conspiracy theories. After a review, a review of all of the documents in the relevant FBI and MI6 files, a Swedish diplomat contends that the financier's understanding of diplomacy was limited, and his attempts to find ground for avoiding war in three discussions with Hermann Goering were naive. In the upper left, I copy a part of Vanegren's English summary of one of these discussions to that noted German agent, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. The diplomat concludes that there is no hard evidence that merits blacklisting. It rankled Vanegren for the rest of his life, however. He even expressed hope that Bennett would campaign for justice on this issue, 
another example of political naivete. After the war, his investment decisions became less astute. In 1952, he began to pour money into a monorail company in Germany, Alweg, in the upper right, which pardoned war, in which pardoned war criminal Alfred Krupp held an interest and which folded in 1964. In the early 50s, he also dabbled in computers in the US, which led to Alvac, um, which had been billed as the uh, um, early competitor to IBM in the lower right. Vennegren transferred sundry elements of the business to Sweden, where he lost even more money. And he also invested heavily in a series of real estate ventures, both in Mexico and the Bahamas, in the lower left. For more than 30 years then, dividends from Electrolux shares provided a solid base for his other ventures. But after he relinquished his holdings in 1956, the same year as he came to BC, he became increasingly vulnerable. OK, first set of uh, numbers as well as another caricature of uh, Van Agren. Um, the last one, and it's usually the bold one that I'd like you at least try to uh, not to remember, but it's the most important one of the series. This was done um, as a memo for his death estate um, a year after Van Agren died. And of course, the value then was 15 million. The two below were created by different Swedish scholars, uh, uh, and I've just put them in because those are the only global estimates of Venegren's wealth that we have. Why is this important? Well, now, this chart indicates um, his wealth between those three black dots. The three black dots are, they're not certain, but at least they have uh, um, numbers and figures to support some of what they estimate. The blue dots in between have nothing of the sort. Um, that uh, they go up and down from the black dots according to my reading of all the sources concerning Van Agren's business actions. I could change my evaluation of these blue dots next week by discovering an additional source. I hope I don't. But they strongly suggest that the actual reign, or range rather, of Vennegren's wealth was far below popular appraisals. So even if we were to jump a little bit more than that range there, from 10 million um, at the bottom to $30 million at the top, just think about what I said earlier. In its obituary for Vennegren in 1961, the New York Times declared Venegren was a billionaire. Quite a difference, yes? All right, at last. That's the context. Now we apply that context to BC. Within this context, uh, that uh, the most important individuals, besides the financier who shaped Vega Bese's opening and closing, are Bernard Gore on the um, left of the bottom photo. He was president of Vega Bese. He was a Jewish lawyer from Poland who escaped the Nazis and spent the, the war in Britain and then teamed up with a Swedish businessman to create an import-export building that shipped, amongst other things, Israeli fruit to Sweden. Gore frequently forwarded information concerning BC to Birger Stried on the right in the bottom photo. Street was managing director of Fulcrum, Vennegren's holding company in Sweden, as well as general manager and chief rapporteur for all of Vennegren's projects across the globe. Both have been described as his lieutenants or as henchmen. They were clearly Vennegren's subordinates. Street's reports to Vennegren provide the most important source that I discovered in Sweden last year for exploring Vennegren's actions in BC. Now, I need to make three caveats about Streed's reports. The first is they're, they're incomplete. Streed made at least one report to the financier every week for five years, um, but only about 50 survive. In most of his reports, Streed reviewed developments in many other projects besides BC, from Sweden to the US to Mexico. I had to wade through all of this to find a nugget or two in each about BC. 
And finally, and perhaps most important, almost 15 years after Van der Graan's death in 61, Street was tried and convicted of fraud and breach of trust in Sweden after mismanaging the funds of one of the philanthropic organizations that Van der Graan had created. But after studying the activities and accounts of managers with dubious motives and bad judgment in other concerns for much of my academic life, I find this not off-putting, but an exhilarating challenge. OK, so it begins with Percy Gray. The creator of the Vanegren project was not the financier or subordinates, but this gentleman, Percy Gray, in the upper left, a British landscape architect who'd worked on development plans for Malaya during the war. In the early 50s in London, his neighbor across the street was Bernard Gore, in the process of becoming one of Van Ergen's lieutenants. When an acquaintance informed Gray in May 1956 that Premier Bennett was keen on northern extensions of the uh, Pacific Great Eastern, Gray, after consulting with Gore and obtaining sources from BC House in London, created a development proposal with a focus on railway extension that contained a concession of some 50,000 square miles, 130,000 square kilometers, embracing the watersheds of the Peace, uh, Parsnip, and Finlay rivers uh, in the um, upper right, larger than the concession finally worked out in early 57. The final uh, official plan in the lower left was reduced to 40,000 square miles, about 103,000 square kilometers, and extended uh, to the Yukon border because of legal concerns about current claims for oil drilling. To allow more time to review uh, Street's reports in the remainder of my talk, and my comments about the remaining events in this narrative, the agreement and the surveys, beyond Street's discussion of them, will necessarily be brief, if not abrupt. So, the agreement, the secret agreement of 1956, Vanegren undertook three things. He would um, uh, spend $5 million uh, on um, survey work. He would provide the government with a $500,000 deposit, and he would build a monorail through the concession. BC, on the other hand, undertook to place reserves on railway rights, mineral rights, forest rights, and hydroelectric rights within the concession. But as I said earlier, neither the borders nor the precise area of the project is made clear. So let's talk about Streed's comments about the agreement now. Um, he wrote a letter to Van Agren, this time in Swedish, in the same, same day that the secret agreement was signed in 16 November 1956. So Streed wrote, Gore has done a brilliant job for us. All he promised has been included. We have all rights in an area between 50 and 60,000 square miles. Concerning the railway, we believe our experts uh, can create a high-speed monorail here with large capacity. And because of the strategic value of the railway, we can count on US transport, which already wants to extend the railway 50 or 100 miles. If we play our cards right, we can build the railway with contributions and loans from others. Concerning mining, Street wrote, the region is much richer than we believed. There is an enormous asbestos deposit, of course, this was Cassiar, which will become the first large client of the railway, except that Cassiar was many, many kilometers west of the route through the Rocky Mountain Trench. About forests, he said, mature forests up to the Alaska border will provide a base for at least three or four large paper mills. But water power, he said the least, surprisingly enough, only noted that an English or British um, uh, electrical engineering firm had already approached Gore about doing surveys. Street concluded, there are enormous opportunities here, which will make the doctor very happy. We have a much better deal than we hoped for. We have all this for practically nothing. And this is a view that was shared by Norris a year later in a cartoon in the Vancouver Sun. I hope you can read the caption. It says, a Mr. Vanegren dropped by 
And, well, you know, the premier's boundless generosity. And that's what the remains of the legislative buildings after Van der Graan came. There's one more thing, though, that I need one more remark that um, Street made um, concerning the agreement that I need to point out right now. In his discussion of railways, Street wrote Van der Graan, I was lucky to dismiss Bennett's idea that we should buy the existing railway system for $70 million. We simply do not have that capital. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is an attempt, rather, by the U.S. Finance Department to map the companies created and controlled by Van Gren shortly after his blacklisting in 1942, and it indicates just how complex the corporate web was in the early 40s. The correspondence that I read hints that it was even more complex 15 years later as Van der Graan entered BC. So now let's talk about Begabese with a vengeance. On the right, I have a list of five companies that are uh, connected with Begabese. Um, in Swedish, as opposed to English, we don't talk about parents and um, subsidiaries. We talk about mothers and daughters, much more familiar. So the mother corporation, Vegabese, was not based in Vancouver. It was based in Nassau. It had $5 million capitalization, and it was completely controlled by Venegran and Gore. Pan American Corporation was a Panamanian company uh, based in Nassau with bookkeeping in Mexico. Can you imagine anything more efficient? And it was um, uh, Van der Graan's second holding company for all his concerns outside Sweden. The daughter corporations, Street made a point of insisting, will stay under Bahamas guidance and they will get their money from the Bahamas. The most important of which was Vega Base Company Limited in Vancouver, which you can see, very small, $100,000 um, a common shares, also 100% controlled by Vanagran and Gore. The third one, Stockholm, um, is even less, 100,000 kroner, about $20,000 more or less. I read the books in Stockholm, hoping I would get some real insights into how Vanagran moved his money around. This is peanuts. Uh, it, all it did was just, was just uh, it, it, there was very little in those books that I think is relevant here. The last two in New York and London were created legally, but I have no evidence that they ever became active in any of Anna Gren's business concerns here in BC. So let's talk about the meetings between uh, Bennett and Van Gren that took place first time in March 1957. And this is, of course, a staged photo, which I got from a book in Sweden. Um, it is not available in any of the archival uh, um, uh, collections that I have examined. So if any of you have this negative at home in your basement, please let me know. Um, Venegren flew from Mexico City, um, where he had yet another mansion, to um, Vancouver in March 1957. And the first thing that happened were two press conferences, first in Vancouver, and uh, the second in, um, uh, in Victoria, the Empress. Um, below the photo stream at the top in Vancouver, the reporter had written a man's man uh, and claimed that at the end, uh, by answering questions honestly and bluntly, uh, Venegren had the reporters in his hand. He had mastered the, uh, the, uh, um, the room. The second is, I think, a little more interesting for us right here, because Van der Graan makes uh, a couple of statements which are provocative, to put it mildly. He says, in answering one reporter's question, if the surveys prove satisfactory, an industrial kingdom featuring pulp mills, power plants, mineral production, and a monorail will be built in the area, the investment might exceed $1 billion if there is economic foundation for it. Well, you can see what happened. The comment led to the um, uh, headline in The Citizen and, of course, the Barton cartoon in um, the um, province. Again, that might not be too clear. The caption, it says uh, in the cartoon, I've never seen it fail. 
throw money around and you'll attract the crowd. And in a more relaxed setting, um, one can use the diary to get Vanegren's personal views of his meetings with um, BC politicians. The first meeting they had was at Government House. Um, Lieutenant Governor put on a spread and uh, the uh, um, uh, Premier and his ministers dropped in for uh, um, a, a meal and then a sit down and chin wag afterwards. And we can see in the upper left uh, a rather relaxed picture in which Ray Williston, the Minister of Lands and Forest, is on the left of the two protagonists and Street is on the right. Um, Van Gren wrote in his diary about this. I had dinner at eight with Premier Bennett and almost all his ministers. They're very pleasant, and Bennett is especially likable. Um, the next day, um, 12th of March, which is in the lower, or, sorry, the lower right, um, Van Gren wrote in his diary, I arrived at 9.30 at the Premier's office with the, uh, uh, and spoke about our plans with the Inner Cabinet and the Premier. They could not have been more sympathetic or understanding. Of course, a prince needs to be seen working during these events, and Vanegren made a couple of promenades. Vanegren or his subordinates examined the Challenger relief map at the PNE on the right, and then inspected a diorama of an Arctic city on the left. What Vanegren wrote about this was, all this intense activity really tires me out. So I think that his comments about the trip, as well as the press conferences and the promenades, indicate that the encounter was about as superficial as a royal visit. Let's talk about surveys. The BC Archives has four different sets of published reports created by the British firm, British Thompson Houston, under the direction of engineer Ralph Chantrell in the upper left, which were submitted to Vega Base from the spring of 1958 through to May 1960. But the most important report was the first interim one, which was submitted in August or September 1957. This interim report first indicated the possibility of hydroelectric installations on the piece that could generate 4 million horsepower. It triggered the second agreement between Vanegren and BC in October 1957, which called for a dedicated company for hydro development. Um, article 4 of that second agreement um, stipulated at least two Canadians resident in the province shall be members of the board of directors of the company so formed. Canadians shall also be given the opportunity to participate in the capital financing of the company. And as you can see by a picture of the directors uh, at the bottom of this screen, um, the only Swede in the picture right at the back is Birger Stried. Everyone else is not Swedish. It appears that Swedish control was receding. Not really. As the table on the right indicate, indicates, Benegren was very much in control of this firm as he was with Vega Bese. Um, that they, of the $9.7 million uh, capitalization to begin with, uh, Venegren and Gore cre uh, control 86% of it. And even more astounding was that they managed to issue stock at a discount. That is, they paid one-third of what everybody else had to pay to get the stock in this company. Uh, this has been described as, uh, well, it, uh, um, lawyers use all sorts of words to describe this. It was very much in their interest. Um, Mannering, of course, the uh, uh, president of, uh, of uh, Vega Base defended Vanegren's control but skirted the discount, mentioning to um, a, a radio host that six ve since Vanegren's interest had already spent $2.7 million on surveys when PRP was created, it was only natural that Vanegren held the majority of shares. <laughs> 
And what could be more natural than holding the majority of shares? So Streed's comments. So that's why he's back um, with Vandegren here. Um, first one is one, uh, one of the few letters by Vandegren in this correspondence. So Vandegren is writing to Street, and he's writing in English. And he says, Vandegren says, it's unthinkable to give up the BC project even if it will be very difficult to finance. Even if we must sell certain assets far below their value, we would rather do this than reduce our activities in BC. Surely we can supply money to require to complete the surveys. Two years later, oops, two years later, Chantrell, uh, uh, um, uh, rather, Street reported to Van Agren, Chantrell's re latest report has convinced BC and the Canadian government that the peace must have priority over the Columbia. Just because I sold 500,000 PRP shares today for a dollar does not mean I think they have a higher value in the future. A month later, um, Street reports a conflict with Bennett. Bennett had informed Gore that he was worried about the fall election and that he risked losing on the ground of his contacts with Van Gren. References were made in the discussion to Van Gren's blacklisting and Krupp's investment in the monorail. But these were not new, so that they, were, they had appeared in other reports before this one that I read. Bennett more or less required that we sell out our shares in PRP. Gore uh, uh, um, came back and reminded Bennett instead of all that Vegabese had done for the province and underlined that Bennett should be thankful to Van uh, In uh, A year later, in March 61, Street uh, reports that we still have debts for the surveying firms, but it appears that PRP will go public on the stock exchange later in the year. This, he predicted, will give us a tremendous prestige and economic advantage, and if in a short time we shall be able to refinance. According to English experts, shares in PRP will be worth 10 times their value in 10 years. The last comment comes from Van Agren, the day after nationalization in August 61. I wonder whether the Premier really will be able to compensate us fully for this action. It was through the Peace River enterprise that we should make our big money in BC, and which, at least to me, was the main attraction for our entering the BC venture. Now, Street had, uh, or rather, uh, Vandegren had written this to Street in English, but in the margin, Street makes a note, and he, he writes in Swedish, fel, which means wrong. So what does all this mean? Well, here's the second um, list of numbers. Again, you don't need to remember um, any of them. The one at the bottom is the most important, but I'm going to try and explain a little bit uh, of what they mean. At the top was the expenditure that Megabese had made on surveys before the creation of PRP. They spent $2.7 million. And that meant in the second line, when PRP stock was issued, um, they transformed that spending, that expenditure of 2.7, into 8.1 million shares because they got them at one-third value. It's always good to be on the inside with shares. 58-61, the period, the remaining period before nationalization, there was almost a million dollars additional money spent on um, surveys for hydroelectric projects. But during that same three-year period, um, Street and others had managed to sell Vanagrand shares, 3.1 million of them, but they sold them not at 33 cents, but at par, a dollar. And that netted Vanagrand $3.1 million. And lastly, when nationalization worked itself out, compensation uh, was uh, arranged at 50 cents on the dollar, so for the remaining 5 million shares that Vanegren held, he got $2.5 million. So you add up all the pluses and minuses on that table, and you find out that Vanegren got $1.9 million profit from PRP. And he got that profit because it was nationalized. <laughs> 
Street um, said the same thing, um, writing shortly thereafter. Our organization has received more than has been invested from PRP, partly through the earlier sale of stock and partly through redemption. The problem, the problem was, however, even though they got a return of 1.9 million, is that that profit was immediately whisked away from British Columbia to support other failing Van de Grand concerns around the world. So they got the money, but it was never used to support anything in British Columbia. It had to go to the Bahamas and Mexico and Sweden. OK, um, railways. Here we go with mo uh, monorails, sort of. This is the only part of the development plan that has received some scholarly analysis. That a monorail was expected at the outset is indicated by the requirement in the 56 agreement that Vanagran would incorporate another subsidiary concern, Alveg BC. Alveg, remember, was his monorail company. The first map in the province on the left separated from the constructed PGE the proposed Rocky Mountain Trench Line. McLean's in the upper right placed a monorail on its map of Vanagran land. And ever optimistic, the Prince George citizen in the lower right imagined a monorail rocketing to Prince George. What could be more fun? Now, Alveg technology was effective. It was used to build both the Disneyland circuit and the uh, monorail Seattle Center for the World's Fair in the upper left. But its design made it more suitable for carrying passengers rather than freight. Alveg tried to counter doubts by proposing an auxiliary rail um, where containers could be shifted back and forth in the lower left, but it was never constructed. By 1962, Vanagren's executors admitted that the monorail was not suitable to haul heavy freight. Even more of a factor than technology was cost. When an engineer, a monorail engineer, accompanied Vanagren to his uh, meetings with Bennett in the spring of 1957, he did a quick calculation to suggest just how much a monorail would cost. He suggested that for the 650 kilometers for the Rocky Mountain Trench, the average cost would be more than $300,000 per kilometer. You work all that out, and it comes to $200 million for a railway from nowhere to nowhere with no resources and no possibilities of through traffic at the other end. The $200 million figure, estimate, is more than all of the railways in British Columbia, not just the PGE, but the CPR and the CNR as well, were um, evaluated at during the 1950s. What a deal. In place of the monorail then, very quickly, Bagabese decided that a, a conventional railway line was necessary and it would be built not on the uh, Rocky Mountain Trench Line, which was uh, going to be, of course, flooded. It would be built well. It would be uh, built west of the Rocky Mountain Trench, under the direction of New York Transit Authority engineer S. H. Bingham on the right. It provided the route for the future Dees Lake extension in the center, and uh, at a cost, 1,120 kilometers. 225,000 mile per kilometer of $251 million. So the original monorail was 200 to get to the Yukon border. This improvement was $250 million to get to the Yukon border. That's good business. Um, Street wrote in 1959 that we are going to begin the survey uh, in May of that year and we will reach the Alaska border by September. In eight sections with two helicopters, he expected the cost of the survey to be 300000 A year later, he had to change his tune. The development continues to be very promising, he wrote Vanagren. We have created a separate uh, um, company with um, five partners with 20% each. However, we have expended $900,000 on the railway survey. 
which we will transform into an asset for this company. When you expend money, you make it an asset. I wish I could do that in my taxes. Um, we have a chance at survival, of the first period of railway operation with large losses with such fine partners. And now, of course, comes to uh, um, one of the really wonderful episodes of British Columbia Railway history. On the 29th of July, 1960, one day ahead of the deadline prescribed in the 1956 agreement, a camp was set up on the uh, future um, southern terminus of the PNR at Summit Lake. Camp is in the lower right, and a podium was constructed as well, which you can see in operation in the upper left. Gore, the president of Vega Base, announced from the podium, very few believed that the day would come, but it did. But of course, he wasn't the star. And it was. In the uh, upper left, you will see uh, Bennett chopping down, with the help of a uh, muscular logger, uh, the first tree in the right of way. And he's doing it. Look at the, the, the expression on his face. This is his, uh, um, it seems to me, Jack Nicholson shining imitation. He says, uh, and then afterwards he said breathlessly, the railway will never stop until it reaches the Yukon. Graders and railway crew quickly moved in, graded, uh, and laid about 100 meters of track. The Norris cartoon in the center was drawn a year later. It shows the tree that Bennett chopped down as in the far left uh, National Historic Site. <laughs> and we see some would-be passengers waiting at the station where the podium was for the first PNR train. And you can see here on the right the PNR marshalling yards. And you can see just how much had been done in a year. Um, for hundreds of disappointed job seekers in Prince George, the PNR was not a dream that would surely reach the, uh, um, the Yukon. It was instead probably no railway. That's what it meant. This did not, however, um, prevent Street, in the, of course the upper right, from celebrating this great event of Van der Graan. He wrote just a few weeks later, our railway opening has gone brilliantly. We have only good publicity, and if Gore's pr uh, plans go forward, the railway company will be a real feather in our cap. Okay. Mineral surveys, very quickly. Um, there wasn't much known about minerals in northeastern BC. Um, Venegren chose as his surveyor Hans Lundgren in the upper left, uh, who came from Malmö, not far from Venegren's hometown. Um, he had developed techniques of aerial prospecting. So I'll just read you one comment that uh, Street m made about this. We have even staked an uh, ore deposit which is relatively small, but with good ore south of Hazelton, um, uh, Lundberg is convinced that he can convince a large company to go 50-50 partners on our deposits. In 10 years, we could extract $100 million from this ore uh, um, deposit. In a month, we shall know whether we have a new Klondike with 1% gold and 12% copper. Street added, however, that Lundberg's earlier selections of gas and oil had not worked out. And he hoped this time that he predicted correctly. He didn't. And just one comment about the forestry surveys. This about we there's less about the forest forestry rights than any other. In 1961, just a few months before um, um, uh, nationalization, um, Street wrote to Vanegren, in May we can have a forest license from the government, but the price is $300,000. It could be sold for $2.5 million, according to Gore. If we keep it together with our license for PRP, that's the hydroelectric uh, company, it will be worth much more. Let us do all we can to obtain the necessary 300,000. Our friend is most positive 
three of the world's largest firms are ready to join us. A month later, Gore, in Street's correspondence, wrote to Van Agren, except for planning, we cannot do very much as we are handicapped here by a complete lack of money. To finalize the forestry concessions, we need about $300,000, and we simply have not got it. OK, last set of numbers. Um, we need to um, um, talk about estimates. What happened in British Columbia? You already know what happened to PRP. Van Agren had made a profit of $1.9 million. When he died in 1962, his uh, executors assigned a book value to Vega Bese, everything that remained at $2.6 million. But I had no idea how did they ever reach this number because one of the people that was the executor was a good friend, Streed, who you know so much about and seems ever so reliable. So what I did was I looked through all of the numbers that Streed had written to Van Agren, and I put them into a list. And then what we get are a whole set of expenditures, mining, timber, railways, and then expenses. Our expenses are always wonderful. And we get 2.5 million and change from that. So these expenditures, were uh, uh, what created the book value. When in doubt, I'll do this when you're doing your taxes this year, always make your expenditures into assets. It's a great thing to do. And this is what Van Agren excelled at, and so did his executors. Um, that, uh, um, so that this is what was there after Van Agren died, but s this money had simply been thrown away. There was never any significant attempt to develop either minerals or forestry. Van Agren's, the, the companies that were there, simply did not have the money even to begin to develop these things, let alone complete them. So ultimately, finally, what's the profit and loss? Well, if you've been following my numbers, and I hope I've got them right, from PRP, Van Agren uh, had made 1.9 mil. However, Vega Bese, after he died, had lost 2.6 mil. So that meant all of the effort in BC had led to a total loss of about $750,000. Right, so what does this mean ultimately? BC did not bankrupt an otherwise financially sound Venegran enterprise, as one historian maintains because the entire concern had been spiraling downward for several years through a series of bad investment decisions. The small return from PRP did not reverse this direction. The manner by which two Van Agren companies in BC reached opposite outcomes, profit and loss, is simply one fascinating example of a much larger case of business failure. In February 61, uh, about six months before nationalization, Van uh, wrote uh, in uh, a letter to Streed in an afterthought. In the letter, Van had talked mostly about real estate in the Bahamas. But then he changed his mind and wrote about something else. He said uh, he informed Streed that he, that is Van Grant, had bought a silver crown for his wife Marguerite as a Christmas present. I should have paid the dealer 3,000 3, kroner long ago, about $500. But I wait until he writes about the matter, and then we say that as he has not presented the bill, we have forgotten to remit the money. Petty debt evasion is hardly the action of someone the New York Times describes as a billionaire. That the larger case of business failure remains little studied, I think, is the result of legal obstacles, ideological inclinations, and organizational in inertia in Sweden. Vanegren's activities, both in BC and elsewhere, deserve better. In a letter that, in English that's, that Vanegren wrote in, in April 61, he looked forward in Form Street to more good news from BC, four months before nationalization. But in a postscript, to this letter in English. Van Agren um, um, scrawled in Swedish, and it really was a scroll. 
perhaps we should continue to fall back, even in BC, so that we can finally get off this never-ending treadmill, which really begins to exhaust me. Taksumika, thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate that. I, I imagine the audience has some questions for you. If not, you know, we'll just run you out of town on a rail. Um, just, on a monorail, no less. Um, a question just to start. Uh, at what point does someone like W.A.C. Bennett or indeed the folks around W.A.C. Bennett begin to suss out that this is a BS deal? Well, they, they, the, the Bennett is quite smug in his uh, um, oral reminiscences with David Mitchell. He said the B.C. government never gave Van Grant any uh, uh, um, um, rights that they never gave the resources of B.C. away. They just allowed Van Grant to have first dibs. And therefore, when these things went down the tubes, except for PRP, um, that uh, they said, well, we knew better even if Vanegren did not. So he's quite smug, and I guess rightly so, that he perhaps had a better sense of how this might work out than uh, certainly than somebody like Street did at the outset. Good. Questions from the crew? Folks, here's your chance. <laughs> Any queries, questions? Yes, sir. One, one quick one. Yes. Have you ever speculated on the similarities between uh, Lenegren and uh, Dyson? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, that, uh, but there is, of course, a, well, you may know this and you may not know, that in the 1970s, long after this, in the early 1980s in Britain, uh, um, uh, um, Electrolux, of course, had a factory in Britain as well. And so they decided that they needed a snappy ad campaign in Britain. So on TV, um, for a number of months, there was a, uh, uh, an ad campaign, and the, the logo at the bottom said, nothing sucks like Electrolux. <laughs> I'm sure Dyson was envious. Any other questions, folks? Ted. Oh, there's lots. I mean, there are these. these there, there are conspiracy theories. There are all kinds of things, uh, um, uh, Ted. But that um, much of this has to do with things that were really outside the documents in the FBI and the MI6 files. There are there are all kinds of conspiracy th theories, good and bad. Uh, but that there's no evidence for this in the in, in the files at the time. So it's not that I want to say that uh, they're, they're, they're worth nothing. It's just that we don't have evidence about these that strike me as being, you know, part of the decision to blacklist. Anything else, folks? Please, sir. Yeah, um, No, I don't think that. Were there other motives for him doing Well, I think that, that the, the other motive is what I suggested at the, at, at the outset, which it seems to me business historians uh, um, have, been, have been too lax about. It's, I'm surprised how much uh, is written academically about business history in which uh, um, these historians do not deign to deal with the vul vulgar subject of money. And it seems to me that if we are going to understand what happens here, and in many other cases as well, we have to consider money. Um, there was no possibility that this would ever get off the ground in the way that Canadian newspapers and people in BC had envisaged it, just because Benegrin did not have the capital to do it, even if he had the intention. His only goal was to make a profit. And if we forget that, we just don't understand what this is all about. <laughs> 
Other questions, folks? Um, to do the standard social history question, um, what does this mean for understanding Northern British Columbians? Um, do they see this as finally we're getting our deliverance? Do, do folks buy in? I mean, the, the citizen is, is uh, terribly excited about the possibilities of this. Um, do they buy it hook, line, or sinker, or are they just hopeful that, well, finally we're getting our due? I think it's, it's a long-standing uh, uh, um, view in BC that uh, boosterism um, uh, goes back at least a century. Uh, and that people who are um, living on the margins, in some respects, hard scrabble existence, um, are, are desperate for something. And what Vanegren promised, particularly in these images of the monorail and the futuristic dams and so forth, it was bringing uh, um, uh, the uh, region into the modern stream. So not only would, um, would Northern BC catch up with those nasty people in the lower mainland. But by having this, 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 this incredibly futuristic monorail, it would surpass uh, um, uh, the lower mainland and that it would become kind of center of British Columbia rather than those people down there. And, 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 and that's been a long-standing view in BC, uh, as I think a lot of people here know, long before Vanegren. And I think one can make the case that it remains a long-standing view in BC long after Vanegrand. Sir, oh, horse, please. Uh, the one dream is a lot of rebuilding after World War II, and we have the resources here. Uh, is any, uh, any other people identify those potential or just seeing this behavior draw attention to Northern BC and accelerate the development? Okay, I'm just not the, the, the is certainly his, the, the activities drew attention to Northern BC. In Canadian newspapers for a little while, they couldn't get enough of, of, of Vanegrand, and that's why they reprinted all of this boilerplate nonsense from, uh, um, from wire services. I particularly like the province using the ultra, the, um, ultra um, reliable source, the um, uh, cyclopedic book to try and get background about Vanegren because they had no other source for information about the international mystery man than this, um, you know, uh, I guess the, the business version of the farmer's almanac or something of the sort. And it's, I mean, what is really interesting is, is that the mistakes and the misinterpretations that Canadian newspapers make about Vanegren are, I think, matched and sometimes exceeded by the way, Swedish newspapers talk about British Columbia. It really is like it's, it's, it's the end of the world. They have, they have maps where they're not quite sure where Vancouver is, and Prince George, well, I mean, wasn't he somebody in the royalty or whatever? What has this got to do with anything? So that, that, that um, it would be a fun, fun exercise, at least I think it would be a fun exercise, to compare the mistakes made in Canadian newspapers about Vanegren and the Swedish, the Swedish uh, uh, project with Swedish reaction to this as uh, uh, um, just at, at the end of the earth. Sir. If, if we sort of accept that his plan was to make money by selling shares as opposed to make money by running a railroad. Yes. Uh, where was his target audience to sell these? Was it European investors? Yes. British investors? No, no, no. It was the, um, 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 they, I mean, there are stories in the business press, and we all know how reliable they are, uh, that uh, where um, reputable uh, um, 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 financial houses in both Britain and uh, um, Europe were just salivating to get part of PRP because they thought it was going to be um, um, the big winner. But of course, when they bought in, they had to buy them at full value, a dollar a share. So Vanegren and Street could say, oh, I'm so sorry, I have to sell you these 500,000 um, shares. You know, it only means I'm gonna make a, you know, a million two out of them, but I really am sorry that I have to let them go because I wanna hold on to them. I don't think that was the case. That was a much better way to make money than to try and develop the North. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, then if, I, and uh, uh, that, that if one remembers back to the 1980s, it seems so long ago, uh, when Skytrain was developed, there was there were lots of futuristic stuff about how this was going to be so much more efficient than any other kind of metro line in any other uh, um, city. And I remember seeing television uh, um, uh, images of the of the the model Skytrain. Uh, uh, um, um, factory and, 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 and layout in Kingston, Ontario, which is much like the um, Van der Grand's model uh, um, uh, Alweg uh, system in Cologne, uh, Germany. Uh, and, and the same kinds of things. This was going to be ever so much more efficient and it was going to be better and faster and everything else. I mean, people really have a desire, I think, uh, to uh, um, uh, make use of technology to make their lives better. I think it's just unfortunate that they don't understand sometimes that there are costs. I think there's a uh, episode of The Simpsons that deals with this actually. <laughs> For those of you who get the cultural reference, um, perhaps we're nearing the end, but I, I, I do want to ask a question about kind of closing the circle. Your original research was on the Grand Trunk Pacific and how it was supposed to deliver Northern British Columbia to the world and the world to Northern British Columbia. Um, is this then the late 1950s and 1960s version of that story? Except, of course, there wasn't, uh, in uh, Van der Gren's case, there wasn't nearly as much capital involved. So the ideas, I think, between Van der Gren, uh, and particularly Street, I suppose, and Charles Hayes are similar, but Van der Gren didn't buy a ticket on the Titanic. Maybe it would have been better if he had. <laughs> All right, folks, I, I think that's enough, and Frank has probably earned his dinner. So uh, on behalf of the group, I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Frank Leonard.